since I'm going to start, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to do a bit of an introduction and then I'm going to pass it over to the esteemed Bob, Aaron, who uh, we are thrilled to have with us today. So first off, uh, as always, let me start by saying um, that unlike our forum, which is private uh, and only for members, um, our videos are public. Uh, they go on a variety of public forums, including my website. This one will be on Bob's website and other areas. So be advised that anything that is said today is public um, and is publicly facing. Um, that being said, uh, just one bit of administrative news. We are approaching 2,500 members um, in our Facebook feed. For that, I thank you all. If you know anyone else who meets our criteria, please ask them to join. It would be a pleasure. Now to the business of the day. Um, today, we have a talk by the esteemed Bob Aaron just a bit about Bob and then I'll talk about what he's talking about. Uh, Bob is, I don't know how to say this any other way other than uh, the godfather really of real estate. When people like myself, David Feld or others have issues with real estate and we don't know where to turn, the natural place to call is Bob Aaron. Uh, Bob Aaron has more information and more legal acumen and knowledge than uh, most lawyers have, uh, well, you can bundle up 10 of them together at the end of their career and they probably don't have what Bob has with regards to legal knowledge. He knows this stuff cold. That Bob Aaron has chosen to speak to us today about uh, the topic that has really been the number one request, cottage and lakefront properties, is a real treat. It's something very few of us know anything about, but Bob is, as I said, uh, not your average bear. Um, and to that end, uh, wasting time listening to me talk as opposed to Bob is not worth anyone's mud dime. I'm going to turn it over. Uh, Bob, thank you very much for today. One thing I would say administratively is that Bob is not going to be monitoring the chat function today. He will leave time for questions and answers. If I see any chats that pop up, I'll call Bob's attention to them. But be advised that the appropriate way to actually get attention is to ask a question uh, not type it just because Bob is going to be deep in thought and PowerPoint. So there we go. Bob, over to you. <laughs> I, I, I thank you for the introduction. I was wondering who you were talking about. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Nice words. Thank you. Can I ask everybody as a, an administrative matter to uh, mute their microphones? I see there's a couple of people who are are not muted, so uh, I'm gonna ask you to mute. Okay, now I am going to share my screen. Oh, am I the host, Mark? No, I'm making you the host right now, Bob. One okay. second, hold on, just give me one minute. Yeah, you're now the host, Bob. Okay, so I am going to share my screen, everybody, with my PowerPoint presentation. Um, and I'm hoping that you can all see it. Uh, if my picture and Mark's picture are in the way, you can just drag it sideways to so you can see the whole PowerPoint. So Mark, can everybody see the PowerPoint? Coming through clearly, Bob. Okay. So today's discussion is about a hot topic, uh, which is... Uh-huh. Okay, everything you need to know about lakefront and cottage properties. Okay, somebody's got their microphone on. Mark, can you mute everybody? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through everyone and mute them, yes. You can All just right. go ahead and I'll, I'll take care of the mute. Okay. All right, so lakefront and cottage properties, totally different from condos, totally different from city properties. Um, here's a little introduction for me from the Toronto Star website. My column appears every other, uh, every other Saturday in the home section or the property section, whatever they call it. And uh, uh, it's also on my website and the Toronto Star's website. There's, since the year 2000, there's been about, oh, 750 columns and it's searchable. So. A lot of the stuff you see today or will see today, I have written about. So uh, the theme of today is buying a cottage is unlike other real estate transactions. So unlike condos, unlike city properties, the most important issue is 
Where is the cottage? Does the legal description match the physical location? So in cottage property, you may say that, uh, or you may see that the cottages are part of the north half of the southern 50 feet of concession three, lot, uh, lot 22. It's very difficult sometimes to find out where the cottages are. Okay, now I know that some of you online don't really like surveys, but let me tell you about uh, the value of a survey. Holmes versus Walker, case 1998. Holmes buys a cottage on Georgian Bay. There was no survey. It turns out, he found out later, that 95% of the cottage building was sitting on a township road allowance adjacent to his, uh, adjacent to his property. There was no survey. He didn't know it. The vendor didn't know it. The buyer sued for rescission to set aside the contract. It went to trial, it went to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal said, you didn't get a survey, too bad, your property is sitting on a road allowance. It turned out that the township was willing to rent, uh, to rent the owner, uh, Holmes, was willing to rent him the use of the, um, of the road allowance, but the problem is, how do you sell it when you only own title to 5% of your cottage? and 95% was not. So uh, this gentleman was out of luck with respect to the value of his property. This one is one of my all time favorite cases uh, with, with talking about a survey. The case is Zytel versus Elscheid. It went up to the Supreme Court of Canada. So here's what happened. There's two islands in Georgian Bay. Rock Island, it was 99B, that was the number, Rock Island 99B, incorrectly because of the municipal records was taxed as if it had a cottage on it. Cottage Island 99D was taxed as if it was a bare rock. So in 1964, Jean Strain bought Cottage Island believing she had Rock Island and she paid for it appropriately. Eventually she decided quite properly, Rock Island was worthless and she stopped paying taxes. So the municipality, as it is entitled to do, set up a tax sale. And Elshade and Simmons bought what they thought was Rock Island for $999. As a result of the mistake in the municipal records, they became the owners of a very valuable cottage island. And the law says that once you buy under a tax sale, it's, you cannot set it aside. It's final and binding. The case went up to the Supreme Court of Canada. Obviously, Elsheed and Simmons wanted the other cottage, and the Supreme Court of Canada says, sorry, you didn't get a survey. Uh, no luck. Of course, the, the owners of the cottage island had to surrender it. So this is a little bit of uh, a lesson for uh, people who say, ah, it's cottage property, you don't need a survey. My take is, yeah, you do need a survey. So how to verify the location. And I, I do a lot of cottage conveyancing and virtually in none of the cases, um, there's a survey and that's a problem. So my recommendation is either the agent, the realtor or the lawyer or the vendor get a reference plan if it's sitting on one and a reference plan is indicated on the title on Geo Warehouse or on Terranet by a number like 46R and then a number. Or get the subdivision plan. Of course, get the survey if it's available. Uh, if you're the realtor for the seller or the buyer, ask the lawyer to plot the land on a subdivision map or a lot in concession so you can verify it. And that way the realtor will avoid responsibility for verifying the location and dimensions. And I cannot say this strongly enough Title insurance does not cover everything. So here's a case, I'm not trying to pick on this poor guy, July 29, 2003, RICO. There was a discipline hearing and one of the issues uh, in uh, alleging violation of the code of ethics was that the realtor didn't get a survey. And the finding was that the realtor breached uh, a whole bunch of particulars of the code of ethics and one of them was failing to make the offer conditional on approval of the survey. 
and the other one was failing to advise the buyers to have an expert review the survey if the agent couldn't do it. So don't get yourself caught in this trap. Always, always, always verify the location in any way you can. So I can't say this strongly enough, a land survey is the most important document in a transaction, and frankly, in any transaction, city, rural, even a condo, always get the survey or the condominium plans. Title insurance, everybody says, well, you don't need, you don't need a survey because you get title insurance. So here's my take on that. Title insurance is not a, sub, a substitute for a survey. And using title insurance as a replacement for a survey is like buying theft insurance for your car and leaving the door unlocked with the keys under the mat. Always for your buyers, recommend title insurance and a survey, and especially it's important in cottage country. Uh, and in my column of November 8, 2019, which is on the STAR website and uh, on my website, uh, how a property survey could have prevented a pricey court judgment. Uh, here's, a, here's one. Uh, this one was a, August 16, 2019. First Canadian, which is not one of my favorite title insurers, uh, denies title insurance coverage over the cottage's prior defects. The cottage was basically worthless, and the title insurance company said, too bad, you're stuck with the cottage as it is, and it was completely unlivable. Here's what a survey, here's the value of a survey and what you won't get, won't know if the cottage is located on someone else's land. This, without a survey, you won't know if the cottage is located on someone else's land. If erosion has created a gap between the land and the water. If there are encroachments into the land or onto a neighbor's land. And if the septic bed is on a neighbor's land or if the well is too close to the septic bed. Um, a survey is important for all of these things. If you don't have a survey, you won't know. Here's another column. If you're eyeing a cottage property, just don't look for water, look for road access. So it's very important, how do you get there from here? There are a number of types of access in cottage conveyancing. Number one is a provincial highway right to the door, or an upper tier municipal road, or private roads or private access roads, which are fairly common. Crown access roads, which is owned by the federal or the provincial government. A deeded or not deeded right of way. So you can have a right of way, but no right to use it. Uh, a dirt path or what's called a trespass road, or in the case of an island, or uh, a land cottage where there's no roadway, water access only. So make sure there's deeded access. This is one of my favorite stories. My family in 1958 bought a 125 foot piece of land on Peninsula Lake uh, right next to Tim Horton's cottage. Uh, my aunt bought the property earlier and eventually sold it to Tim Horton and um, my parents had the lot, the lot next to it. In those days, in the 50s, nobody really cared about the niceties of a, uh, a survey. And decades later, when my parents went to sell the property, it turned out that the deeded access, uh, on paper it looked good, but on the ground it went straight up a granite cliff and it was totally unusable. The actual access, which was used by my aunt and Tim Horton and the neighbors, the actual access went through a cow pasture and it was fine. So when we went to sell the property, we had to purchase a deeded right away from the children of the farmers, the farmer who owned the land, the cow pasture. And we had to spend thousands of dollars in legal and surveying to give up the improper access and acquire a proper deeded access, which tracked the, uh, the dirt path through the cow pasture. So be very, very careful how to get there from here. That's very important. Another issue is who maintains the access? Sometimes the dirt road has no maintenance. Sometimes, and this is fairly common, there's a private road association where the neighbors get together every Labor Day weekend and they say, okay, everybody kick in 
uh, 50 bucks. And in more modern uh, developments, there's vacant land condominiums where the roadway is owned by the condominium and every adjoining owner kicks into the condominium reserve fund. Does title insurance cover the lack of deeded access? No. If you buy a cottage and there is not proper access, title insurance will not cover the lack of deeded access and will not give you a deeded access. They may give you a little bit of money to cover it, but that doesn't help. Um, it won't allow you to have coverage for marketability. And above all, title insurance is not a solution to all unknown defects. So as a realtor, you cannot say to your buyers, uh, we don't have a roadway, but title insurance will cover it. Most definitely it will not. And that's very important. You can have a lovely cottage, but the only way to get there is by a helicopter or by a boat if you can't have a roadway that you have a right to. So here's one, this goes back to 2008. Road access is critical when buying a cottage. And by the way, the star has a paywall. So if you can't access the star's website, um, all these, col all these columns are on my website at aaron.ca. So let's talk about island property. The big issue is how do you get there? It, it would seem that uh, you get in a boat, you take the boat over to the island and you're there. One of the problems, of course, is how do you get the fridge over or how do you get your uh, bed over? There's problems with, with road access. Or can you get your maintenance man to come over? Dock to dock is fine, but do you have a right to a dock in the city or sorry, in the, in the nearest mainland? So you have to ask, where's the nearest marina? And is mooring space available at the marina? So the marina could say, sorry, we're booked up this season. And I had a case once where there was deeded access to the boat launch. So the deed said, my title is including the right to go from the marina dock to the cottage dock, but there was nowhere to park a car. And the marina said, sorry, you can't park here. And that was a huge problem. So you have to be very careful reviewing what rights there are to, uh, to, have, to access a boat launch and then park your car and your boat trailer at the boat launch. Big issue in cottage country these days is short-term rentals. So you've got to be very careful to check the prohibitions on title or check the municipality records and bylaws. Sometimes uh, they prohibit Airbnb unless it's a licensed bed and breakfast. So when you're acting on a cottage purchase or even on a cottage sale, make sure you know what the buyer wants to do with the property in terms of rentals. So they may want to rent it out in say May and June and then use it in uh, July and August. Uh, you have to be very, very careful of what the local bylaws uh, provide. And what is the intended use? You have to be careful on uh, checking where the, whether the buyer is going to use it for a rental. And then there's an HST issue if you are buying to rent. Don't give your buyers or your sellers tax advice. Point it out and say, you get your own advice. Now let's talk about, this is very important, original shore road allowances, OSRA. Back in the 19th century, Crown surveys typically laid out 66 foot road allowance on the banks of lakes and rivers. And that road allowance was vested in the crown and now the municipalities, which means that they own 66 feet between your cottage, your cottage lot and the lake. These road allowances were originally intended for military or commercial transport and logging. Uh, some of them date back to the war of 1812. You have to ask your client, uh, vendor or purchaser, is it important? Does the property go to the water's edge? Or is, it, is the deed ending at 66 feet from the water's edge? Now, many parts of cottage country have 66 foot shore road allowances. Uh, some of them don't. On the smaller lakes, they don't. But you have to be very, very careful. You don't want to guarantee your uh, 
your client's property has waterfront when frankly it does not have waterfront. So these shore road allowances were largely ignored until the 1970s and then organized groups of snowmobilers and ATV owners said, hey, we can drive in front of everybody's cottages along these lakes and they can't stop us because it's crown land. So shore road allowances now belong to the municipalities and the public has a right of access and passage and camping. So somebody, you, you, you might come out of your cottage one day and find somebody has pulled up a boat along the shore and erected a tent right in front of your cottage and there's no restrictions on that. So even the fact that nobody has ever used these public rights of way doesn't affect the right of somebody in a snowmobile or an ATV or a canoe and a tent to pitch the tent or to use the land in front of your cottage on the 66 foot shore road allowance. So it's very, very important to make sure whether you're buying or selling, whether or not there is a shore road allowance. And if you are uncomfortable in searching the title, or in verifying to your buyer or seller that there is or is not a shore road allowance, get the lawyer to do it, pass the obligation to someone else. So, summary, be very careful. If there is an original shore road allowance, the owner does not own to the water's edge. There is a public road between the property and the water, which is owned by the municipality. And if you have a cottage or a bunkie or a boathouse, located on the shore road allowance, the municipality can remove it because you don't own it. Some local municipalities have a, a policy that they will sell the shore road allowances to adjacent owners. And if they do, all you'd have to do is throw money at it. And sometimes it's very expensive. Some municipalities say, sorry, we're not selling them. So one of the things you have to do is to review the original, and it may be an 1800 and something plan of subdivision, to see whether the land that you're buying or selling touches the high water mark. If it does, there's no shore road allowance. If there is, then you don't own the land to the water and you don't have waterfront. Get the lawyer to investigate it. And above all, don't guarantee or advertise waterfront without checking who owns or whether there is in existence a shore road allowance. Okay, somebody's got a mute here. Okay, household water. The other water issue is what are you gonna use for water? Uh, so you can have household water from the lake, from a drilled well, from a dug well, or from a municipal water supply. So you need a water test showing zero coliform, zero E. coli, zero fuel, but it may not be potable. So you should always get a potability certificate. Now, here's the question. What good is a potable source of water if you can only get three gallons a day? So this issue is often ignored in agreements of purchase and sale. You need a well driller certificate to determine a sustained flow rate that the equipment is working. So a well driller will say, I ran the water for an hour and it, it shows me that there is a verifiable uh, source uh, at the rate of X liters or X gallons per hour and that's fine. The problem of course is when you've got a winter purchase and you can't get testing, what do you do? Do you have a hold back? Do you have a guarantee? How do you guarantee this. Okay, so that's the issue. Um, problems with winter purchases, you can't do testing. Where does the water go? So unless you have an outhouse, there are some serious issues for realtors. Don't warrant the legality of the system. Okay, Mark, can you mute everybody? You know, Bob, I'm having trouble because I'm no longer the moderator, so I no longer have the ability to mute. Um, okay. Guys, can everyone can everyone please just mute themselves? It's quite important, or else or else I'm gonna we're gonna have to pause for a minute and then give me back the moderation so I can mute everyone. Okay. Thank thanks. You. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Um, issues for realtors: Don't warrant the legality of the 
uh, of the septic system, unless you got a really good, um, unless you got a really good insurance policy and you don't care about, uh, you don't care about um, um, insurance claims or deductibles. The issues are in the agreement of purchase and sale, either the vendor is to warrant or the purchaser shall verify on his or her own were the proper approvals obtained. Is it in good working order? Are there no working order, uh, work orders or outstanding violations against the septic system? Is it beyond its lifespan? Because some of these things don't last forever. So is it beyond its lifespan? Above all, get a septic inspection. Get a septic inspection. I can't tell you how important that is. Sometimes a cottage will be built with one washroom and one bedroom, and then over years, uh, they add three more bedrooms and two more bathrooms, but they still use the original septic. Uh, they still use the original septic system. So you have to know, is it big enough for the size of the cottage? Above all, please check with the municipality, see what the uh, perm see whether there was a permit, get a copy of the permit. The permit will show you a rough sketch of where the septic bed is so you don't dig into it and make sure in your agreement of purchase and sale that the septic tank is to be pumped by the vendor before closing so the uh, buyers can get a fresh start. So I said this before, the cottage may have been large but the septic system was not. And here's the problem. Some municipalities don't have septic records. I remember once doing a search and it turned out that some years before the municipal offices burned down and there were no records. So that was a, that was a problem. So make sure in the agreement there's a municipal search for septic compliance and an installation permit. And always make sure the buyer gets a septic inspection search. Somebody who goes along and uh, does the inspection, flushes the toilet, runs the water, uh, I don't know what the septic inspectors do. Sometimes they put dye down the system and then they watch it come through at the other end. Be very careful, get a septic inspection search. And here's another problem. Is the well too close to the septic bed? So you, won't, you don't wanna have a wonderful septic system and a wonderful uh, well, but if they're too close to each other, there's gonna be potential contamination sources. So be very careful that the septic system and the well for drinking water are separate and apart from each other. Here's some other things to consider. If you're out in the country, is there a landline phone service? Is there cellular service? Is there electricity? Do you have to bring in electricity at a huge cost from the nearest uh, municipal roadway? Is there garbage collection or do you have to pick up your garbage every Tuesday and take it to the town dump? Is there snow plowing so you can get there in the winter? Is there cable TV? Is there postal service or do you have to go to the local general delivery box? And this is me uh, on any vacation. I need to have wireless. I need to be in contact with my clients. And I just thought this, this cartoon uh, by Aislin was very cute because you can be way out in the middle of nowhere and if there's no wireless, you're really in trouble. Now, another thing that's often ignored, get a fireplace inspection. A lot of cottages have fireplaces. Uh, if the fireplace is not working properly, it can get uh, carbon monoxide into the cottage and as you know, that can be fatal. So always insert a condition that the transaction is subject to a satisfactory WETT inspection. That stands for Wood Energy Transfer, Wood Energy Technology Transfer, WETTINC.ca. It's a nonprofit organization and you will want a fireplace inspector to come and make sure that the stove or the fireplace uh, that all the toxic gases are going up the chimney and not back into the cottage. HST, this is very interesting. If you're buying vacant land or if you're buying, depending on what the seller was using it for, if the seller was an HST registrant, the property may be subject to HST. So always make sure that HST is included 
when acting for the buyer. Repeat, always make sure HST is included when acting for the buyer. Big issue, docks and boathouses. So the bed of most lakes or rivers is owned by the Ontario Crown. And if you've got a boathouse or a dock sitting on the bed of the lake, you don't own it. So whether, or, whether you're buying or selling, make sure there was a permit or license from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry or the local municipality. Now, sometimes the cottage lot extends out into the water. There, there are water lots on Lake Ontario. So if your lot extends into the water and your dock is sitting on land that you own, even though it's underwater, it's not subject to ministry governance. So you have to ask your buyer if, uh, if and if there's no dock or boathouse, does he or she intend to build a dock or boathouse because you're going to need permits? And they may or may not issue them. They may or may not be expensive. Section 211 of the Public Lands Act allows people to occupy public lands to erect prescribed structures on certain conditions. What does that mean in English? You can use public land, which is the land underneath uh, the water, um, on certain conditions if you comply. So does the boat or dock house, sorry, does the dock or boat house have a permit? Will the seller warrant the uh, permit or does the buyer have to investigate? What representations are you going to put in the listing? Now, many docks are removed from the water and stored on land for the winter. So if you're buying off season, this is a wonderful case an a that I reported in 2002. Agent drafts an offer. The offer is silent on the docks, which had been lifted out of the water and they were sitting on the land on the front uh, lawn of the, uh, of the property of the cottage. The offer was silent on the docks which were stored on the land. The seller removes the docks on closing and the buyer sues and loses. Went to small claims court and because they weren't fixtures attached to anything and because they weren't listed in the offer as being included, they weren't part of the deal and the buyer uh, sued and lost. And uh, you have to wonder what the agent's responsibility for this was in not adding the uh, docks to the offer. What is a riparian right? You've, you may have heard this term. When a parcel of land touches a lake or river, its owners have riparian rights. It's not an ownership right, it's not in your deed, but in, it in riparian rights in Old English common law include the right of access to and the use of water for domestic purposes such as bathing, cleaning, and navigating. What is accretion? Accretion is the gradual increase in the size of a parcel of land as a result of the lowering of adjacent water levels or the washing up of sand or soil to form new solid ground or frankly the dumping of new sand or soil onto the um, onto the property. Some years ago, I was acting on the purchase of a, I think I th it was an island cottage, and I think it was in the Nottawasaga River, I'm not sure, but it was uh, a cottage on an island in a river. Uh, my clients got a survey before closing, and it turned out that about three quarters of the cottage was sitting on <coughs> excuse me, what we call accreted land or land that was added after the original crown grant of the island. So the owner had title to an island which was about a quarter of the, um, which was about a quarter of the deeded land um, and three quarters of the cottage was sitting on accreted land which the owner didn't own. There was accretion. The property was built on, I don't know whether it was because the water level had gone down or somebody had added land to the island, but that deal blew because the owner did not have title to three quarters of the cottage. So be very careful about accretion. And accretion doesn't always go to uh, islands. It can go to um, it can go to uh, land on the mainland. So 
in this column in 2008, I quote, Mark Twain said, buy land, they're not making it anymore, but actually they are making it because of accretion when water levels decline, as we saw in recent years, the lot goes into the lake and your boat may have to be way out in what was a bay and now it's dry land. And this was a very interesting case, which you can look up in Alberta. So here's what happened. If you can see on the far right side of the picture, there's a little gray, uh, there's a little black area, that's water. And everything between water and the old shoreline, which you can see in red or yellow, everything there was previously underwater, but because of the water levels lowering, um, the, uh, there was new dry land. Now, when you can see in red and those yellow rectangles along the middle or left side, those were the original lots. Well, how do you figure out who gets the, uh, who gets the quote, new land? Who owns the land which used to be underwater and is now not? So the guy in the red extends his southern boundary right into the old sea, lake bed and the people in yellow said, no, 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 Th that's our land because we're extending our lot lines. And that was the, the case in this, um, in, in, in this court case in Alberta. The problem was who gets the new land, uh, which uh, came about because of the lowering water levels. Interesting problem. So again, I write here in 2018, cottage purchasers need to know the land boundaries of the lakefront property. This is a wonderful case, the floating boathouse. So as I said before, the bed of most lakes or rivers is owned by the Ontario Crown. So in this case in 2015, somebody puts up a thousand square foot dock and boathouse, uh, two stories, but instead of getting permission to anchor it to the bed of the lake, they attach it to their cottage land by steel cables and they're not touching the lake bed. So it was a beautiful, expensive addition, boathouse and dock. And the owner said, well, we're not using the lake bed. We don't need a permit. The neighbors objected to the loss of view because this, this gorgeous boathouse was blocking their view and it went to court and the judge says sorry you need provincial and municipal permits because it was sitting above the lake even though it wasn't touching the bed you need to get permits and you need to get a municipal occupancy permit so the the clever owners lost out another thing to be careful of is the cottage or beach on land sitting on land that is the subject of ab aboriginal land claims so I'm, I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but uh, you remember the, the huge fight in Douglas Creek Estates, the standoff at Caledonia. You can read the case if you want, but uh, you don't want to get uh, land that is on, uh, you don't wanna get a cottage that's on Aboriginal land. Uh, some years, well, a couple of centuries ago, Toronto was the subject of, of an Aboriginal land claim. Much of the city of Toronto I believe that's now been resolved. So what other kinds of cottages can you buy? You can have recreational condominiums such as Friday Harbor. You can have timeshares and fractional ownership such as the Muskokan Resort Club or the cottages at Windermere. I'm not a big fan of timeshares or fractional ownership. So I'm just gonna put that out there. I'm not gonna talk in detail about this, but it's awkward. You don't have your full ownership rights as you do in Fee Simple. Um, I'm okay with recreational condominiums. I think Friday Harbor is a wonderful development, uh, but you have to be careful that your clients understand what they are buying. And that's it. So I'm gonna thank you for watching. We have a lot of time left for questions. I see there's a lot of questions. And Mark, if you'll tell me how to hand it back to you, we can go back to, oh, I'm gonna stop sharing, okay. And, okay. Mark, how do I? I, I...
Bob, you know what? We can just keep you as the host. That's not going to be an issue. Uh, there's okay. quite a few questions here. I know, Ish, if you want to start with the questions, and then maybe, Dennis, you can follow up, and then we can just open it up. Ish, you had a question. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, hey, Bob, thank you. That was very informative. Um, I wanted to get some details on water when you were discussing about the flow rate. So I bought a cottage in November, and the cottage sits on the Muskoka River. Now, when I had the home inspector come in, he could not get down to the well to test uh, anything because he said that there is a certain place from where the water from the river gets into the well and then it flushes into your home through the foot valve and the pressure tank and everything holds in. I haven't had any issues, but my concern is that with the fact that uh, if there's a flood in the river and the water rises up, would that affect the water flow and would that affect the well? Well, I think if there's too much water, that's not an issue. But some years ago, I had clients in Orangeville and they had a property served by a well and the well dried up uh, and they had to bring water in. And I had that recently somewhere north of Toronto, it might've been in Innisfil, where the water dried up and they had to bring it in again. So you have to be very careful about uh, the flow rate and the adequacy of the, the system. Got it. And my second question was that I got the survey from the seller and uh, as per that, uh, they, were, they actually bought the property two years ago from the original owners and they were informed that almost about 15 feet of uh, the property uh, towards the water was flushed out back in about 40 years ago. And so it shows that it's 140 feet in actual, but then the measurement happened, it was only 122. So we presume what 18 to 20 feet of that was flushed out uh, in course of time. Now, would that be a concern down the road if I look to sell? Well, if you have a deed to a 140 foot parcel uh, and you're absolutely certain that the measurement, the proper measurement was 122 feet, uh, where did the extra uh, land go? It looks like the land was probably underwater and that you own uh, 18 feet under the water in front of your property. Okay, sounds good. That's that's something what I wanted to know. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, Dennis. Uh, Dennis, why don't we have your question? Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, hosting here, guys. Uh, just want to ask with regards to uh, septics. Um, I've heard mixed feedback and I've heard valid points on both ends of the argument. Some say, most say that it should be inspected when it's full. Um, some have said that it's best to inspect when empty. Just wondering if you can shed some light on that and <laughs> I'm trying to get a firm answer on which way is the right way to do it. Okay, my answer to that is neither you nor I went to septic school. <laughs> and I would take I would take the advice of a local septic guy, a guy who spent his whole life shoveling the sure. tanks out. <laughs> not not for me to say. Uh, but I won't I won't ask the septic guy for legal advice either. Okay, and if you have time, I do have one more question about water. From what I understand, uh, when uh, wells are inspected for potability or potability. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Um, the criteria is pretty flimsy for the city's potability test. And I've spoken to some water experts and uh, it apparently should be a lot more in depth. And just cause water is potable, it isn't necessarily potable according to let's say Peel or Halton region's criteria on their potability testing. Is that true? I have always thought that the testing was done by the Ministry of Health and that you take a sample and the last time we did this, take a sample and mail it into the ministry and they do the testing. Um, if I was advising clients, I would say go with the um, regulatory authority that has these stricter standards and uh, Either that or get one of those ultraviolet filters under your kitchen or bathroom sink, or don't use uh, 
the water supply for drinking water. You can use it for showering or toilet or whatever, but don't drink the water from the taps. Gotcha. Uh, all right, uh, Donna, just, I'm just take, taking questions in the order that the chat has them. Donna, yes, recordings of all of our um, sessions are always available. This one here will be available in our normal dis, uh, chat boards, but I think it will also be on Bob's uh, website so you should have plenty of opportunity to review this if you need. Um, Ivar, you have a question, please go ahead. Hi guys, thanks for taking my question. Um, you mentioned um, how important this survey is in, in a real estate trade, and I was wondering, uh, this is not cottage related, but uh, would you suggest to your clients for a property, let's say in East York, and doesn't have a survey, that they shouldn't buy it because of that? Well, in East York, let's put it this way. I would get the plan of subdivision. I would go to um, Google Street View. I would count the number of houses between uh, the two intersections and say to your client, look, we don't have a plan, uh, but it looks like you're the fourth house from this street and the third house from the next street. Um, is, is that where your house is? Um, another thing I, I always do is I go online to landsurveyrecords.com or protectyourboundaries.com and I look up and see if there's a survey. Always, always, always. One of the particular problems in East York is that shared driveways are not mutual on title. They're, mut they're mutual on the ground. But this is a horrible problem in East York where the driveways um, are shared um, in fact, but not in law. And I've seen fences go down driveways and I've seen some ugly, uh, I've seen some ugly um, cases where, uh, where people get into fights with neighbors uh, over driveways. Um, Ultimately, that kind of thing is probably covered by title insurance, but I'm not going to guarantee it. What you can do is you can say to your title insurer, look, here's the situation. I've checked all these sources. Are you going to cover me for the, lo the loss of a driveway or for my house sitting on the neighbor's property? Okay, thank you. Nice shirt, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, who else has questions? Let's open it up. Anyone feel free to pipe up if you have a question. Can I hop in if we have time? <laughs> I don't want to be asking all the questions, but I'm um, just wondering, uh, would you advise, Bob, uh, who's, when we're looking over uh, surveys, which I should be on it? yours, the lawyers. I mean, we're very careful about giving legal advice. So what are we looking out for on a survey? Who's looking it over other than ourselves and our clients? Well, I would say to the client, look, here's the survey. This is the dimension. This is the frontage. This is the depth. Does this structure, which is shown on the survey, correspond to the envelope uh, that you uh, that you understand. It, was there an addition? Is there a pool? Is there an outhouse? Is there a pump house? Is there a dock or deck? Uh, is this survey accurate? And then make notes to say, look, I went over it. And then in order to uh, separate yourself from liability, you say, look, I want you to send this survey to your lawyer and he'll, he and you will be the ultimate people to check this out. So if you're a realtor, just say, look, here's the survey. We've gone over it, but you're going to have second eyes from your lawyer. Don't assume the responsibility uh, that you and your insurance company or RICO will have the final say on whether you did everything right. Pass off the responsibility. All right. I'm just reading the comments here. It seems that... Uh... There's consensus that testing seems to be done by the Ministry of Health there. So that's, that's good. I, that's what I thought. Yeah. Um, anyone else, guys? Anyone else have a question? All right. 
So look, we've had a well-attended session today. At one point we had, about, oh, we have Donna who's asking what about private roads? Donna, do you want to pipe up and actually ask your question? Because there's quite a few questions, I guess, about private roads. Donna, you're going to have question. to unmute. Yeah, final question, we'll go to Donna. Oh, Donna oh, doesn't have, have a, a Donna doesn't have a speaker. <laughs> okay, All Donna, right. do you want to write down your question? I have a feeling she's doing so. <laughs> Maybe if somebody has a right of way or an easement through another uh, another uh, neighbor's property. Here we go. Any, any title issues with private roads? Absolutely. Uh, as I told you about our family vacant lot on Peninsula Lake. Um, there was a private road which had been used for decades, uh, decades before my parents bought it in the 50s and decades afterwards. And when we went to sell it, because everybody's careful now, um, we found out that the private road, we had no rights to use it. It was a trespass road. Um, and, uh, and we had to correct it or we, didn't, we couldn't give title. So yes, private roads are fine as long as you have the right to use it. And as long as, uh, and as, long as uh, there is some sort of agreement about repairing it. So I've seen cases where private roads are fine, everybody's got a right to use it, nobody wants to fix it, or somebody does want to fix it and the owner of the land under the private road says, ooh, you can't put gravel on my road. We're not going to allow you to do that. And by the way, a lot of these roads back in the day, I remember this, a lot of these roads, they used to pour oil on the roads to keep the dust down, which is a big no-no today, but back in the day, it was fine. By the way, okay, uh, gonna... by the way, I just want to say, I have written some papers for talking about the importance of a survey um, and the survey being the most important document. I've given that paper to lawyers. I've given it to um, real estate agents. I've given it to surveys. If anybody wants that paper on the importance of surveys, send me an email to bob at aaron.ca and I'll be happy to email it to you. Okay, we have two last questions and then we're gonna call it for the day, Bob. Uh, first one's gonna be for Katie and the second one's gonna be back to Ish. He started the questions, he'll end them. So Katie, go ahead um, and then uh, Ish and then we will close down. Okay, um, hi Bob, hi everyone. Um, hi Katie. I hope this isn't too basic a question because I'm a newer agent, um, but I'm trying to help some people find a cottage, so buyer agent. Um, when it comes down to, you know, like the surveys and trying to get as much information as you can, it seems like quite a bit of work. Um, that's not the problem. What I guess what I want to ask is, um, should I be advising the clients to get as much information before they put an offer in? Or do you think it's safe to put an offer with the conditions, you know, of like, you know, everything goes okay after we get this report, that report, all that kind of stuff? Just, just wondering if you have anything to say about that. Um, Katie, that's really a marketing issue. Oh, okay. Um, you know, if, if, if you're in a big rush, I would say do both. Get as much as you can before. And um, if, you, if, you're, if you can in today's market, uh, by all means, um, make it conditional. But sometimes it's difficult to do conditions. Right, like if it's a hot market, right? And there's like all these buyers fighting for it and you don't have time to do that, right? Yeah, I'm that told it? that the market for recreational properties is quite warm now because of the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, everybody wants more space now, right? Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, Ish, hit it, last, take us home. Yes, so uh, last question. So for example, if a street is registered with the city, it has postal service, it has garbage pickup, but it has a road association actually maintaining it all through the year on based on a service fee every year, would that still be considered as a private road or would that be just a uh, mention on a listing say maintained privately? I don't see, I guess it depends on who owns the road. If the fee simple in the road is owned by an association or owned by a group of people, uh, then they have to maintain it, even though the municipality will, uh, will deliver, um, will deliver mail and pick up garbage, but you have to be very careful on, uh, on, on who owns it. 
Would that be on the survey though? Mm, no, it would be on the plan of subdivision. Uh, it might be on the survey. Um, you can also just pick up the phone and call the municipality and, and ask who owns the, the land, who owns the roadway going from here to there. Got it. Okay. Sounds good. Perfect. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. A pleasure. All right. So guys, I, I, one thing I want to stress here is this. I've been doing real estate for 20 years myself. And because I don't regularly focus on cottage properties, half of what Bob was bringing up were things that I wouldn't have had on my radar, which is one of the reasons that as a lawyer, I refer to those people who know. Bob is someone who clearly knows. If you have cottage properties that need conveyancing, if you have cottage questions, it's vitally important that you don't just go to your friendly neighborhood lawyer who's been excellent for your condo purchase in downtown Toronto, but understand that there are specialties and there are knowledge bases that are brought to bear on these particular issues. And those knowledge bases are held by individuals like Bob. And having a cottage expert lawyer is really a critical component of being a proper agent and referring to proper professionals. So please do keep that in mind. Please do continue to use Bob for his expertise in these areas and others who specialize in the area. And I can't thank everyone enough. I will tell you, I'm currently, I guess not ironically, but happily at my cottage right now or a cottage right now. And that means that uh, uploading this video may take some hours, but it will be up by end of day today. Uh, a link will be provided to Bob and he'll have it up shortly as well. So everyone can do a recap as they like, uh, certainly by tomorrow morning. I thank everyone for their attendance. We had about 40 people at its height, uh, which means we will have over 100 people see this in about 72 hours. Um, really, really, really pleased and uh, thank everyone for their uh, time and attention today. And thanks for the opportunity to do this. It was fun. Thank you, Bob. Really appreciate it. All the best. Take care, one and all.